Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor to present to you four-star general Tony McPeak. say something this morning about education and uh, leadership. So let's begin by contrasting leadership and management. These are, of course, two quite different things. People who could order me to do it made sure I sat through many presentations on these subjects, uh, during which the speaker, usually an expert with uh, dubious credentials, like me, compared leadership with management. Management nearly always came off poorly in this competition, so I will start with it. Management is about things. And good management is about bringing order to the arrangement of things. Inventory, square footage, money, machinery, the supply chain, these are all things. If we're in business, these things are what we call inputs. They have to be organized. They have to be arranged properly. They have to be managed. Now, there are people who seem to believe in something like a 100% management model. These people have a pretty convincing argument. It's the rational the scientific way to run an operation. After all, you can measure inputs. If you want better productivity, do a time and motion study. Set standards. Find out who's best in class. Track metrics. Then tweak the inputs. Like baking a cake, once you get the inputs right, the recipe, the blend, the output pretty much takes care of itself. Maybe IT is a better metaphor than cake baking. If you get the programming, the software right, the result has got to be correct. Now, in my opinion, when it comes to actually running an operation of any scale, no one is exclusively either a manager or a leader. It's not a binary deal. More like two aspects of the same problem. Nevertheless, there are people who seem to have an almost mystical faith in management. I met a few in uniform and since then in my business life, what you sometimes hear called green eye shade people. Maybe the most famous example would be Robert McNamara, former whiz kid, Ford Motor Company CEO, Secretary of Defense. The pure management model sure sounds good, especially in the classroom. But in the real world, probably everybody in this room has experience, maybe even a little scar tissue, telling you the 100% management model is wrong. Even so, I bet we'd all agree that some management is necessary in any organization of consequence. And I think we'd, we'd also agree that management requires education. If you're going to be CFO of a big city business, you'd better have studied accounting. That MBA still means something, even if Harvard did give one to George W. <laughs> <laughs> so if what you're talking about is management, I'm thinking education is important, no question. Now, as I say, we manage things, inputs. You can't lead them. I've tried leading my checking account here at Dan's Bank. It won't listen. <laughs> Leadership is not about things. It's about people. And it concerns itself not with inputs, but with outputs. A leader's first concern is this. What result are we after? What cake do we want to bake? 
What is it we're trying to get done around here? What's the mission, the objective, the output? And his second question is a natural follow-on. How do I convince people the desired output is important? How do I develop a shared sense of commitment to the organization's goals? So establishing objectives, building a team, calling signals, motivating people, this is what leadership is all about. By the way, people also have to be managed, not just led. Nowadays, if we're talking about the management of people, we call it human resources, as if people were just another input, a thing called headcount. When I hear these uh, disembodied nouns, human resources, headcount. I think of those zombies you see on late night TV. Things you might call headcount in search of human resources. Leadership is about live people, not the living dead, the living, period. While we were looking the other way, these bloodless buzzwords somehow became synonymous with people. Anyway, like it or not, people too have to be managed. It's not just that they must be motivated, led. They have to be selected and trained and paid, evaluated, promoted, retired. These are all essential functions and should be done professionally. And to manage people as distinct from leading them, I think, again, we'd all agree education is a necessary ingredient. Uh, but when it comes to leading people, it's not clear that education is always essential, at least not for leadership at a certain level of organization. It's probably not true that the Confederate general, Nathan Bedford Forrest, said you have to get to our fustus with the mustus a slogan attributed to him and likely meant to illustrate his lack of learning. But there's no doubt he was a cavalry genius and his men would follow him anywhere, did follow him anywhere. You may be able to think of other examples, leaders who could barely read or write, like the great Mexican revolutionary Emiliano Zapata. There have been some magnificent, entirely uneducated leaders at what I'd call the small unit level, an organizational size where only leadership counts. What's small? I think the absolute limit on size is maybe 100 people or so, uh, almost certainly fewer, like say the nine people on a baseball diamond. Casey Stingle, the super successful manager of the New York Yankees, had this smaller number in mind when he said that the key to leadership was keeping the five guys who hate you away from the four guys who haven't made up their mind. <laughs> Snow White's unit was even smaller, seven dwarfs. Come to think of it, a small unit in more ways than one. <laughs> anyway, whatever the number is, it's small. Small enough that everybody in the outfit knows everybody else. And I don't mean well enough to say hi to in the morning. Really know them. If you suddenly come around a corner and catch just a glimpse of the back of somebody walking away and you know with certainty who that was, or when you answer the phone and you can immediately put a face, wrinkles and all, on the voice at the other end, you begin to understand what I mean. But it goes beyond this, especially in a small outfit with a tough assignment. The Thunderbirds had six pilots, and when I was on the team, maybe 40 people total. We spent 270 days a year on the road, away from our families, living in motels, no real difference between on and off duty. We got to know each other. 
In Vietnam, the unit I commanded for a while had 25 people in it, worked from before dawn till well after dark, seven days a week. Had no incentive, by the way, to go off base and socialize with locals. In small units with hard work to do, you get to know each other. The Japanese have a saying, I'd recognize his bones in the stew. That's more what I mean when I say in a small organization, everybody knows everybody else. Now, in contrast with the pure management approach, for small units, the 100% leadership model can work. That's because only two leadership qualities, only two, matter much in a small organization. A leader must be able to do the job himself, hands on, and do it well. And a leader must be trusted by the rest of the team. That's it, pretty simple. By the way, these would not seem to be lofty goals to be at the same time competent and trustworthy. But we find incompetence everywhere, don't we? And keep in mind that both qualities are essential. Competence is necessary, but we all know people who can do the job, even do it well, and we're not so sure we want them doing it. People like this won't be able to lead, so having one of these qualities is not enough. Both are necessary. Together, they are sufficient if we're talking about leadership at a basic level of organization. So the question is, is education necessary to produce competent, trustworthy people? Well, a little learning is never a bad idea, but my opinion is you can possess these leadership qualities in full measure without any formal education. Bedford Forest was unschooled, uncouth, in many ways a failed human being, but he killed 29 Union soldiers personally in hand-to-hand -hand combat and had 30 horses shot out from under him. After the war, he joked he was a horse ahead. <laughs> he performed these feats in full view of his own men. When it came to fighting, he could do it. Could do it well, and his guys knew he could be trusted to do it. Case closed. By the way, it's surprising how good a filter these two leadership qualities can be. That's because everybody in a small organization knows who can do the job and who can be trusted. In this regard, the strong always and ever carry the weak. The strong know it and the weak know it. So often an informal leadership structure emerges on the job and it may not be the one that shows up on the org chart. If you want to know who should be given more responsibility, identify these informal leaders. And that's when you better watch out. When you elevate someone, give them wider scope, broader responsibility, that's when you better start paying attention to education. I was about to say, listen up, here's the point. You know, the foot stomper. But that's so 20th century. Nowadays we'd say, here's the takeaway, right, anyway. What you should remember from this morning's little tirade is that the picture is entirely different in medium and large sized organizations. The problems you run into at small unit level, while never dead simple, are bounded, usually solvable, handled in person and on the spot. At a higher level, the problems are not just variations on what you've seen previously, but of an entirely different kind, changed in their nature. And the leadership qualities required are different. It's not that competence and trustworthiness no longer matter, but even when they are applicable, and even in combination, 
they no longer suffice. I first ran into this phenomenon when I commanded a group which had about a thousand people in it. I was assigned to run an air base with responsibility for its security, the care and maintenance of its structures and pavements, and for a variety of other functions, orphans, really nobody else wanted, like the club system, base housing, sports programs, and as it happened, something called personnel, the buzzword we used before we invented human relations. Anyway, altogether running this group was sort of like being mayor of a small town. I was something like Judy Hammerstadt, except not as good. <laughs> there I was, a misplaced fighter pilot, and my two biggest units were a security police squadron and a civil engineer squadron. Talk about not being able to do the job yourself. Ellie will tell you this. Face to face with a leaky faucet, there's no way you're going to confuse me with a competent civil engineer. <laughs> so the first thing that happens in a medium to large organization is this. You can no longer count on being able to do the job yourself. And the problem only gets worse the bigger the operation gets. When I ran a wing in NATO, I had 6,000 people working for me, three fighter squadrons, 75 F-111 bombers, a very large communication facility, the biggest ammunition dump in Europe, a K-12 school system, seven Costco-sized warehouses full of high-value supplies, a 300-vehicle motor pool with a lot of specialized gear like forklifts and cargo loaders, a bazaar of shops for fixing various kinds of airplane ailments, a 1970s budget of $40 million that did not include our biggest expenses, salaries and aviation POL, because these accounts were centrally administered and not in my budget, hundreds of nuclear bombs in my custody, a largish hospital, Luckily, no one asked me to disassemble any H-bombs or, for that matter, do brain surgery. I had entered a world in which it was impossible to do everything myself, and certainly I did not know all 6,000 people. At least I'd never be able to recognize their bones in the stoop. Based on personal knowledge, I had no way of judging who could be trusted. There, in a nutshell, is the issue when you're trying to lead a large organization. There's just too much going on. Problems become complex, conceptual, cannot be solved in person and on the spot. Frankly, some of the problems can't be solved at all. And leadership is about getting people to live with the problem or ignore it or to fight through the victory in spite of it. The dead giveaway is the word we use to describe this predicament. We work the problem. This is a term of art, meaning we all know it can't be solved, but just be worked. So in a large organization, problems are more difficult by an order of magnitude and nevertheless have to be addressed. You'll need to think in abstractions play three-dimensional chess on a virtual board with imaginary pieces with some rules you know and some they didn't tell you about. It's no easy trick. And just as with management in a small unit, being able to do the mental gymnastics, being able to play the game is only the first of two necessary qualities. To get others to follow, you must also be able to communicate about the game, to tell people what the score is, what yard line we're on, what inning we're in. If, and, it, and it's a big if, but if you can think clearly about complicated matters, then you have to write about them, talk about them, work them with the people you're supposed to be leading. And guess what? Expressing yourself clearly and concisely on complex issues is the most complicated thing there is. 
the echo, the mirror image of the problems themselves. So these are the two qualities needed for senior leadership. You have to think clearly and be able to communicate clearly and concisely about abstractions, about ideas, about complicated matters. And nobody is born with these capabilities. They have to be developed. They have to be learned. The fact that at Gettysburg, he could summarize the huge complexities at stake in only 270 words tells us that Lincoln never stopped educating himself. It's easy to believe that Bedford Forrest or Emiliano Zapata could have popped into the world already possessing the right stuff, the natural gift for small unit leadership. But we cannot imagine either of them delivering the Gettysburg Address. It's here that education is needed. Nothing else prepares us to deal with the world of ideas. It's always a mistake for anybody to compare themselves with Lincoln, but I was lucky enough to uh, get and to give myself an education in the sciences and humanities. Plus, the Air Force is pretty good about educating officers. They think might climb into thin air. I had a college degree when I came in the outfit. They sent me to flying school to learn the trade I practiced at small unit level. You can read all about it in the book uh, you now have, if you contributed to the foundation, <laughs> a book called Hangar Flying. Then the Air Force saw to it, I got a master's degree. They sent me off to staff college, hoping to reduce the fog count in my written work, and later to war college, imagining I should understand something about strategy. For some mysterious reason, they ordered me to live in New York City for a year and work at the Council on Foreign Relations, which I did, kicking and screaming. And for frosting, they sentenced me to a short stretch at the University of Michigan Graduate School of Business, thinking I might have to keep those pesky inputs under control. One way or another, I was being educated, which is to say being prepared to lead large formations. And you can read all about that later this year when I published Below the Zone, volume two of the a trilogy that I have in mind. That is, you can, you can have it go at below the zone if you haven't already been totally turned off by hangar flying. <laughs> so clear thinking, crisp communication, uh, these are hard things to do, requiring, in my opinion, some education. And maybe I should say something more about communication. In any organization, large or small, uh, you'll find that it moves by willing consensus. There's a popular misconception that in the military you just order people around. That's not even close to being accurate. A leader, maybe especially a military leader, makes mission accomplishment possible by creating consensus through effective communication. <clears throat> The process is a lot like what you might call politics if that term had a better reputation. But it's also something more, something akin to statesmanship because it involves qualities like balance and perspective, scope, sizable horizons, what we would today call vision. And the difficulty is in communicating this broader message directly to people. Your morning meeting is with subordinates who leave the meeting to have another meeting with their subordinates who will convene yet another meeting with section chiefs and so on until finally somebody delivers today's message to people, to the people actually doing the work. Even if the message gets through in something close to what you had in mind, this is no way to communicate ideas, perspective, vision. 
In fact, the various impediments to direct communication constitute one of the great frustrations of senior leadership. It's yet another problem not likely to be solved definitively, but I worked it by doing what I called skip echelon communication. I spent many hours on stage, in front of people, teaching. In fact, the title of this morning's conversation should not be educating for leadership, it should be teaching for leadership. I found that in a large organization, teaching is what a leader does. It was certainly the main road I traveled to get over and through the layers of supervision to make sure people knew what we were trying to get done and why it was important to do it right. Let me end where I began with the contrast between leadership and management. For all of us, leadership has this outsized John Wayne image. Here is the supremely active role, having great appeal especially for the folks who you're supposed to be leading. Uh, that's why you lead by being seen, by walking around, by kicking open doors that have been closed too long. This role, leadership, is so much more attractive than management, sitting in your office, keeping the inbox empty, starting meetings on time. Sort of John Wayne versus Rodney Dangerfield. But in the end, if the enterprise is big enough and important enough, the 100% leadership model doesn't work either. Administration gets no respect. Skill at it, vastly underappreciated. But an operation of any size will surely end up in the ditch if those things are not managed. While you're out there looking good, just killing those outputs, the dreaded inputs will eat you alive. Here's what worked for me. Lead in daylight. Manage after dark when nobody's watching. I'm going to end this filibuster now because I want to get to the interesting part, hopefully an exchange between us. But before stopping, uh, let's note that education is important quite apart from any role it has in preparing leaders. Every survey shows we can expect personal income in our working lives to correlate exactly to how far we got in school. Our national standing in the worldwide race to create wealth is today challenged by other countries that continue to raise the bar on education. And aside from these personal and national economic implications, it seems to me that what we call the good life necessarily involves an open-ended commitment to education. Again, I'm not offering myself as any kind of role model, but I take French lessons downtown at the Lyon Francaise, currently uh, every Thursday morning. I've done this for years. It is not making me a better leader. But that doesn't matter now since I run an organization with a headcount of one, unless you include Maddie the Yellow Lab, who seems quite happy with my small unit leadership skills. I'm trying to learn French, uh, not because it will increase my take-home pay. And uh, neither, as far as I can see, has it done much to enhance the country's international standing or reverse our current trade deficit. Uh, but it keeps my neurons snapping at each other, has made for a better inner life, dare I say, joie de vivre, with apologies to anyone here who speaks actual French. <laughs> Education, including mine and I hope yours, is the work of a lifetime. If you want next year to be better, water corn seed. If you want to improve things for the next decade, plant trees. If you want to open at least a small possibility of a generation of peace and prosperity, educate people. <clears throat> At 
Gettysburg, Lincoln criticized his own speech. The remarkable phrase he used was that the world would little note nor long remember what was said there. Of course, the world did know, does remember. So this is a classic case of under-promising and over-delivering, something good leaders do. When I sat down to write this speech, I vowed to include no leadership tips, no, no paint by the numbers do list to be checked off for assured success. And here at the end, I mess it all up by offering you under promise and over deliver. It's good advice and you should forget it immediately. Instead, get an education or support someone else who's in school and who just might make our town, our state, our country better through leadership. Or continue to learn yourself as long as you live. As you exercise that muscle called the brain, you'll figure out your own leadership tips, be able to make up your own checklist. Thank you, it's been a very great pleasure being with you this morning.